Hey, everybody. Today, my guest is Joel Saladin, who is part of the family that owns Polyphase Farms in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley, the farm highlighted in the New York Times bestseller Omnivore's Dilemma and the award-winning documentary Food, Inc. The farm uses no chemicals and raises pasture livestock, including beef, pork, poultry, turkey, lamb, and rabbit, which is directly marketed in the region and shipped nationwide. He is the author of 16 books. Joel Saladin is a sought-after conference speaker on divergent agricultural business and food integrity topics. He is the editor of The Stockman Grass Farmer, and he writes columns in numerous publications. Welcome to the show. I'm really, really happy to talk to you. Thank you. It's really an honor and a privilege to, to be with you, always. Tell us a little bit about your farm and where that sits in kind of the national grid of organic agriculture. Yeah, so, so we're in Virginia, Shenandoah Valley. Our family came here in 1961, and um, mom and dad never made a living from the farm. Like, so, you know, they worked off farm to, dad was an accountant, mom was a school teacher, and that, that paid the mortgage. So by the time I'm getting into a teenage years, I love the farm. I got my first chickens when I was 10 years old, had a little uh, laying, laying chicken business, but dad was very innovative. And, you know, I'm at the stage of my life where I realize now the older I get, the smarter dad was. <laughs> some, some of us get to that point. I'm, and, hoping, uh, I'm hoping my kids get to that point pretty soon. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that be great? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he, he was, this was in the sixties and seventies. And we, we basically had a glorified uh, homestead experimental farm. We milked a couple of cows. We, you know, had some chickens in the big garden, but he was, he was totally, his father had been a charter subscriber to Rodale's Organic Gardening and Farming Magazine in the mid 1940s when it first came out. So he got this ecology kick compost and, and all that from his dad. So we came here, you know, how do you make a living on this small farm? And all the advice was, you know, buy chemicals, borrow more money, plant corn, build silos, graze the wood lot, you know, those kinds of things. And we knew that that wasn't correct ecologically, but more importantly, he understood that it was incorrect economically. You know, we couldn't, you couldn't chemicalize your way into prosperity. You know, you, you had to natural equity your way into prosperity. And so we started looking around and saying, well, well what do we see in Nate? What are patterns in nature? And, you know, they're, they're fairly simple. Animals move. They don't stay in, they don't stay in buildings. They don't stay in places. Uh, there's a lot of diversity. So you don't see single species things. Carbon doesn't move very far, very far. Uh, what builds soil is is decomposing carbon. And, you know, so starting with those kind of things, we just started started developing. I came back to the farm full time September 24, 1982. And uh, it has just, you know, continue, it's, it's not gone fast, but it's just been nice and steady up to where today we're servicing. Uh, we're, we're, it takes about 22 of us to actually, you know, run the farm and, and do do the things that we're doing. And then you market through what kind of distributors? Yeah. So we so our brand is Polyface Farm and we we sell here at the farm. We have about 35 urban drop points within four hours of the farm. So that gets us to Keswick, Maryland, uh, DC, Annapolis, uh, and then down to Williamsburg, uh, Virginia Beach. And of course, northern Northern Virginia is the is the lion's share, Richmond, and then we we ship nationwide as well. We also service some institutions. Of course, you know we lost we lost almost all of our restaurants. We were servicing I don't know what fifty restaurants in 2020 and lost all of them. They're not they're not going, coming back into business. If if you didn't if you didn't have a drive up window in 2020, you were you were in trouble. As you you, have, you didn't have a what a drive up window, you know, in your oh, yeah. restaurant. So fast food, fast food did real well. And I think you've actually uh, pointed this out that the, the COVID, the 2020 was the largest transfer of wealth in the restaurant industry, you know, from white tablecloth, mom and pops, uh, sit down restaurants to fast food restaurants. It transferred that entire, you know, restaurant equity to the, you know, to the great big franchises, as opposed to, you know, embedded small kind of chef owned and, and smaller white tablecloth places, the kind of places that, that we serviced. And so that was a big deal. But the the farm now, we have this production 
but uh, we also do a lot of of peopling. You know, we have a we have a the Lunatic Learning Center. I'm, I'm the lunatic farmer, and so we have the Lunatic Learning Center. We do a lot of farm tours and gatherings and things for you know folks to come and see. And we know there are two ways to get people on board: see it and eat it. And if you can see it and eat it, that's even better. And so that's been a that's been a key part of our whole program. What do you mean by drop points? Are those like uh, farmers markets? No, they're not. They're they're individual homes. Uh, we call them host hostess homes. I think we have one host, and all the rest of them are hostesses. Women buy all the food in the country. Men don't, and uh, we're pleased with that. Okay, so so these are serviced monthly. People order online, and we go in directly from the farm and service. So it's a la carte. There's no, it's not a subscription. It's not a, a volume centric thing, but you buy online and we deliver the orders directly to you. And these become little fellowship hubs. These, these become people meet each other and they become little fellowship hubs of people who care about food, care about the environment, care about uh, livestock care and the, the kind of issues that we care about. And it's wonderful to be able to service them and have them meet each other and build these little, you know, these little tribes, if you will, that understand these, that share these values. It's really wonderful. But I, I still don't understand how it works. Like, you mean, if a, are they little mini distributorships in there? No, 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 mm-hmm. no, no. We're, we're working directly with them. So, so what it is, is they order online and we're going to be in, let's say, whatever, Leesburg, Virginia, on Tuesday. So we, we go every month on a, on a schedule and people order and we compile their orders here and bring them up and they meet us at that host home, at that rendezvous place. They meet us there. So obviously we have to be in places that are conducive to, oh, 30 or 40 people showing up in a one hour period to pick up their food. But it allows us direct contact with our customer. That way they get to see us, we get to see them, and they get to meet each other and, you know, share notes. We do everything possible to try to create a familial operation. And you can't believe how how much people yearn for a connection like this. Uh, last year, we began taking a hen, a laying hen. Uh, we called her Polly Hen. You know, we're Polly Face, so we took Polly Hen. And uh, made a nice little wooden, you know, wooden thing, and and we'd take her, and, and so customers could come and and meet this chicken, and we had people that weren't even customers coming three or four blocks, walking, see, come see the chicken, you know, it, it's in town, it's in the city, you know, come see the chicken. It was crazy. Uh, we could not imagine just the sheer. One one lady kept pulling her son out of school. He was like in third grade, and every month when we came, she'd pull him out of school early so he could come and you know, pet the chicken. It was just a huge, you know, a huge connective thing. So those are the kinds of things that we're doing in addition to obviously, you know, really good food to stimulate the whole story, family, fellowship, connection thing to the food and the farm. Now, I mean, did you make this whole thing up as you were going along or are there, are there models for this happening elsewhere in the country? Yeah, actually, I uh, don't want to take too much credit, but we we kind of conceived of this. Uh, our first, here's the thing. We were unhappy with what we saw at farmer's markets. Now, I'm a friend of farmer's markets. Don't read into this at all. But farmer's markets, they're almost more social uh, social gatherings than than actual transfer of food. You don't, you don't see people at a farmer's market typically, you know, buying a buying a half of beef and buying, you know, a bushel of green beans. And, you know, they're participating in the local food scene, but it's it's one hand only because the other hand's carrying, you know, Fifi, the quaffed poodle dog, and we're all there to kind of, you know, meet each other and, and slap each other on the back for being wonderful people participating in the local food system. And so we we tried numerous farmers markets and we were just never pleased with the investment of time and energy and realized, what if we just use the power of the internet and, and this this is going back now goodness 20 some years uh what if we use that communicate directly with our people and just pre-buy so they're pre-buy so we're not going speculating and we can service them right right where they live 
and they can see us, we can see them, and 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 we can actually electronically kind of electronically aggregate stuff. And it just took off. It took off and it it enabled us to put way more on the truck to get way more for our time and everything was sold before we pulled out of the driveway. So we didn't have to come home and unpack a bunch of stuff that didn't sell. It was all, you know, it was all pre-sold. And there are now numerous farms around the country that have taken this kind of urban drop point idea and adapted it. And it's it's just one of the many, many uh, opportunities that have come to us largely due to internet and the cheap cost of communication now that we didn't have 50 years ago. Yeah, I know. You know, I used to be good friends with Bill Nyman. Yeah. Who started Nyman Ranch. And sure. um, his wife, Nicolette, Nicolette. Actually was an attorney for me that I hired yeah. and I brought her into the hog litigation. And then she met Bill through that and ended up marrying right. her. Now she's a farmer. Their model was very interesting because they aggregated farmers from all over the country who are doing grass-fed beef and uh, and pasture-raised beef mm-hmm. and pork and I think chickens as well, um, maybe other poultry, but they would then go certify these farms, look at their operations, make sure that they were compliant yeah. with these standards, and then they market them nationwide. So you can go to restaurants all over the country and get Nyman pork, Nyman beef, and it's, you know, delicious food. It it tastes completely different than, you know, the Walmart pork. I'm not sure how they're doing right now. I know they had, you know, some reorganizations along the way, but, you know, is there anybody who's now kind of aggregating what you're doing and doing it nationally? Yeah, well, what, you know, what the whole logistics of, of, of distribution has completely changed over the last goodness, just 10 or 15 years, because the the software that UPS and FedEx and these folks use makes it so much more efficient. So, you know, it used to be that in order to to distribute, it, it was very, very expensive for, for a small scale operation. But now we're plugged directly into UPS and the truck comes every Tuesday afternoon and every Wednesday afternoon. And it goes right on the on the truck, and it's it's uh, what's happened. You'll love this. What's happened now is, if you'd have told me five years ago that we would ship eggs, eggs to whatever Los Angeles, I'd have said you were crazy. But we figured out how to do it. We you know we stole some ideas from other people and and uh, did some of our own and, and started doing it. We can now ship eggs into New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Chicago. Los Angeles cheaper than they can get them at farmers market because when you have the level of corruption regulation high taxes defund the police all the things that are that are crumbling these cities it makes business very difficult you can't hire people you can't protect your you can't protect your inventory and as a result places where like where we are out here in in the Shenandoah Valley where we're uh, low taxes, low crime, a great, great work ethic. We can now compete like we never could have before as these big metropolitan areas begin to move into dysfunctionality, you know, from a logistical political standpoint. Part of me is is heartbroken that things are that broken, which is one of the reasons that you're running excites me so much. But things things have become that broken but it's just amazing. We're creating opportunities in niches that we never would have even conceived of just even 10 years ago. Let's talk about another segue into another topic that I have a lot of interest in, which are the bureaucratic impediments and costs on quality food production. How essentially the USDA, the FDA, and these other regulatory agencies are making war on healthy food and organic food and and raising the cost so much of all food in this country and and giving us the lowest quality food and you know all the food that's been corralled through these industrial mazes so that only the you know the worst food is actually reaching the american public and it's yes. high cost tell talk about that yeah well you're you're getting near and dear to my heart you know i 
I wrote a book, Everything I Want to Do is Illegal, de describing or whatever battles the regulatory agencies over the years. And notice I said everything I want to do is, I didn't say everything I do is illegal. I said everything I want to do is illegal. That's, that's an important distinction. But the thing to remember is that all the regulations are size prejudicial. They're size prejudicial. In other words, they're easier to comply with if you're large than if you're small. For example, if I want to make charcuterie, I want to make charcuterie. To get licensed, if to get legal to sell it, I have to have a $5,000 24 seven uh, thermocoupled thermometer. Okay. Well, if I'm making a tractor trailer load of charcuterie, that $5,000 thermometer is not a great big deal. But if I'm making a five gallon bucket or two five gallon buckets in a, you know, on, on my farm or in my cottage uh, industry, that's a game changer that that keeps me from even starting into the business. And so uh, we have an incredible weighted cost because the paperwork and the compliance, this is not about safety. It's not about food safety. It's about the cost of compliance, the overheads, the infrastructure requirements, the compliance paperwork requirements create such an overhead that when you don't have as many pounds of beef or pounds of pork or chicken or whatever to pass under that licensure overhead, the price becomes prohibitive. And so what happens is farmers like us get accused of being, oh, you're a bunch of elitists. You know, you've got this high price stuff. Well, I can tell you most of our high pricing has nothing to do with actual production costs. It's actually trying to squeeze our 300 beef a year through a filter that is, it is built for 5,000 beef a day. And that's the problem is the scale prejudicial nature of these food requirements. And the, the crazy thing about it is that we can give it away. I can go, you know, butcher a pig in the backyard and give it to the neighbors and I'm a great American. But if they give me a dollar for it, now I'm suddenly a criminal. What is it about exchanging, taking a dollar for that, that suddenly turned me from a benevolent, uh, charitable person into, into a criminal? It has nothing to do with the food safety. It has to do with mark access. If you visit Williamsburg, I know you've been to Williamsburg many times. The thing that, that strikes you about Williamsburg, which strikes me, is the amount of industry and value-added activity that's happening in the backyards and in the, in the fields of those little farms or those little demonstration places. I mean, they've got candle makers, spoke makers, you know, leather works casket makers, spinners, weavers, all, all of the, the industry was being done on location. The butcher, baker, and candlestick maker were on location. And today, what's happened is the Industrial Revolution made the butcher, baker, and candlestick maker so big that nobody wanted it near them because it was ugly and smelled bad and dirty and all that. So they wanted them put out here but then when they got out here and nobody could see them, they wanted government government oversight to see behind that razor wire and the, you know and the guard fence and say, what's going on behind that razor wire? Because when people can't see, they want they, they want the security of, of a government agent behind them to see. Well, what's happened now is that with the internet, we have now democratized the ability to get information. I call it Uberized. We, we've Uberized. And just, I'm sure like you, if, if 40 years ago, somebody had said, you know, in about 10 years, millions of people all over the planet are going to jump into cars with, with people that don't even have a chauffeur's license and ask the guy to take them someplace, you know, and, and it's all going to work because if you're a bad passenger, they'll dock you and you won't get a ride. And if they're a bad driver, you'll dock them and they won't get any business. And so the, the internet created, that's called the Uberization, it created, it literally enabled on a global scale, the butcher baker and candlestick maker and the village knowledge that wrapped around these embedded embedded artisans, it vetted the accountability to be duplicated on a very large grand scale. But food, which was the last portion to join the industrial revolution, 
will be the last to exit. We now have the capability to Uberize our food system, to break it down, to democratize it, to create an egalitarian marketplace for entrepreneurial small-scale brands and local food systems. We've never been able to do that as now with Uberization, Airbnb, those kinds of things, have this amazing bureaucracy you're so eloquent to, to talk about that's trying to preserve the taxi cab, that's trying to preserve the chauffeur service and not allow an Uberization of our food system. Years ago, I think it was uh, in the late 90s or early 2000s, I forget which, but I was I did a big campaign in Poland because Poland had this extraordinary organic agricultural system. And the yeah. reason when it was a communist country, they didn't have money to buy chemicals. And you had a lot of small farms that were self-sufficient. And they were, you know, the, the farms were very diverse. They'd have a cow, they'd have a horse, a couple of cows, a couple of horses, they'd have a chicken coop. A lot of them had pigeons, which they ate over there. And then there were, in every town, there were local abattoirs. So there were, which is, a, a, of course, a slaughterhouse, a little slaughterhouse where you could slaughter one hog a day or one, right. you know. Mm -hmm. And then they'd make... Yeah. They'd make this kielbasa, which was famous all over the world. And that's where Polish kielbasa comes from. It comes from sure. these 4,000 little abattoirs that, you know, didn't have any safety regulations. There was no, it was just farmers doing what they'd been doing for 10,000 years, you know, killing their own beef. And of course, you know, back in the old days, there was a, you know, a premium on hygiene because if you, if you were known for selling bad stuff that made people sick, you'd be out of business. Right. So that right. was that was the safety regulation, really. That's right. Market. And then Smithfield wanted to come in and take over hog production in Poland. Oh, it bribed a, uh, an offer to bribe to a, a state official called Andre Leper, who then turned them in. He told me that the uh, second guy in command of Smithfield offered him a million dollar bribe. And the bribe was to pass legislation, which they did end up passing, although, although Leper refused to do it. But it was legislation that said you could not operate. Smithfield had come in and bought the old Soviet slaughterhouses, which were huge. They were like the state-owned yeah. operation, and then right, it was right, modernizing right. them. But it passed a law simultaneously. It sponsored a law, which was then passed, that said that you could not operate a slaughterhouse in Poland unless you had laser automated faucets in your bathrooms. And those are the kind of faucets you see, you know, if you go into an airport bathroom and you don't have to touch anything, you can you yeah. can just wave your hand under the faucet. Right. Well, right. Of course, none of these local abattoirs could afford that. Right. Oh, right. one fell swoop. Smithfield put every one of its competitors yes. out of business yes. by requiring a piece of technology that none yes. of them needed and nobody could afford except for Smithfield. Yes. Oh, so, you know, it was a purposeful, uh, and then of course Smithfield was purchased by the Chinese. It's now a Chinese right. company and it owns, right. I don't know, 30%, 40% of the hog production in our country. And it's really right. a, we're in a colonial model. Yes. It's, you know, USDA now works for China. Yes. Know, uh, yes. Keeping little farmers out of business and yeah. it is colonial model and strip mining and commoditizing our natural resources, our farmland and everything else. It's, it's really a, it's, yes. it's distressing. <laughs> it, it, it is very distressing. What you've just described has happened over and over and over here. Probably one of the uh, biggest epiphanies I ever had was uh, several years ago when Congressman Dennis Kucinich, you may have known him. Congressman he was Dennis my campaign manager until a couple of months. Yeah. Okay. Well, in California, they had that abattoir where that uh, downer cow, uh, they had undercover animal welfare folks that videoed this downer cow, you know, that they prodded and hit with fire hoses and stuff to get her up so she'd stand up and, and get to the knock box and that ended up, you know, closing down the plant and it was a big deal. And Congressman Kucinich convened a congressional hearing on what are we going to do about this slaughter problem in the U.S., the, the handling of these animals in these slaughterhouses. And I wasn't friends with him at the time, but I was friends with one of the other uh, congressmen who was on the committee and uh, or his legislative aide. And he asked me to come and, and be one of the 12, whatever, testifiers at, at the hearing. And so I went up 
and the first guy the first guy who who spent the first goodness he he hogged 20 percent of the whole uh time was the head of food safety inspection service the commissioner of the food safety inspection service and i could not believe here, here's here's the here's the punchline. i could not believe my ears when he said he was reporting how you know how efficient they were and all this stuff and he said our inspectors are now being able to handle way more pounds of beef, way more pounds of animal across the line than they ever had because we've been put so many of the small abattoirs out of business that the pounds, the pounds per hour per inspector are showing how efficient we are. Oh, and I'm sitting there, yeah, I I'm sitting there. Do you have no shame? I thought you were supposed to check on quality. I didn't know that this was a race of efficiency, but then it struck me, well, as you know, the revolving door is there. They've all drunk the same Kool-Aid. They're all in bed together. And so why is it surprising that in an industrial, an industrial corporate food, you know, processing paradigm would engender a similarly volume-based inspection paradigm? And so both of them, and the control, are, the controlling. Are, patting, are patting themselves on the back because they've got so much more volume going through. Nobody cares about quality. Uh, nobody cares about safety. It's just how many pounds can we shove through this plant in a day, both from the corporate and the inspector level. Both of them are after the same, the same goal is how many pounds can we shove through in a day. And that then makes it very difficult for a small plant. You can feel the prejudice against a small, oh, I've got to go down there and see these slow people, you know, that aren't generating the material. And it, it's an overriding prejudice within the entire industry. Yeah, I mean, I remember looking at data back then, and I, I don't know if I could put my finger on it now, but that the, the levels of fecal coliform in the, the large plants uh, were much, much higher than what you were seeing in the small plants because the industrialization of the process and the emphasis on line speed was ending up with actually a, a lower quality product in terms of safety. But of course, you have fewer inspect, you, you know, you can look at a lot more material, a lot more commodity coming through with a single inspector. And if that is the target outcome, how many pounds you can get per inspector hour, Yeah, of course, you're going to shut down every small farmer in the country, every small abattoir. And the whole point of USDA when it was started was to preserve small farmers and food quality. And those yeah. things are now the targets of, you know, of these industrial war machine that is, is putting out of business all the small, small farmers and they don't produce food anymore. They produce commodities. They produce filler for your stomach, but there's nothing in it that's good for you. That's right. You know, we now learn that in 2020, that it has built-in fragility to it. The, the longer your food chain, the longer it is between farm and plate, the more vulnerable it is to, to geopolitical shocks, to economic shocks, to whatever, climate shocks, any kinds of things. And, and so, you know, Putin invades Ukraine, fertilizer jumps 400%, and all the farmers are on national media crying, you know, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do at our farm? It was not even a bobble because we don't buy any of that stuff. And so if we want a secure, safe, stable food system, the less we are tangled up and dependent in these long, these long supply chains, marketing chains, they appear to be efficient, but they're actually very vulnerable and fragile to things that are, you know, that are outside of our control. And so bringing these things to where we scale, we scale not by centralization, but by duplication. So that instead of having, listen, in 2020, do you think we would ha have had a bit as big a, whatever, a, a food hiccup if instead of our country being supplied by 300 mega processing facilities, those funnels, instead, if we had been supplied by 300,000 50 employee community minded neighborhood abattoirs, and canneries and processors. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that if we had had the 300,000 rather than the 300, that we would have been able to handle those shocks far, far better. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really beautiful vision for our, our future. I mean, that's what I'd like to do as president, which is yeah. to give, get us food security back in this country where we're, you know, we have a decentralized supply, where there's diverse sources, where, where they're community-based, where it's small business people, where money being used by consumers to purchase food is going as, as directly as possible to the farmer rather than, you know, to all these multinational intermediaries and, and fertilizer companies and oil refineries and chemical companies, et cetera. And, you know, let's keep it here in the United States and, and use what we've got. So how we get there, you know, from a, from a policy standpoint, there's one side of this issue that says, well, we need to, we need to fight the, do the antitrust stuff. You know, let, let, we got to break up these big companies, break up their, and, and I get that. All right. I understand that. But I seldom see a monopoly that didn't get there with some sort of corrupt collusion with the regulatory agency. And so if you actually preserve liberty and freedom and market access from an entrepreneurial standpoint, people like us can compete fine. I don't have any problem competing. But what I can't compete with is when suddenly my two cows have to go in through a facility that is determined and arbitrated by by Iowa beef packers that's doing 5,000 animals a day. I can't compete at that level of, and I don't need to because two cows are different than 5,000. Like if I'm making meals in my kitchen, it's it's just easier to maintain cleanliness if I'm making 10 meals a day than if I'm making a thousand meals a day. That, 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 that's, it's a whole different thing. And so this scale uh, really does on, on many levels, it has bearing on the actual democratization of food access, both from a consumer standpoint and a producer standpoint. Yeah. And I mean, the other part of that policy directive is to eliminate the subsidies because yes, Industrial food production is almost always driven by subsidies. And when you have subsidies, you get market distortions and, uh, and you lose all the efficiencies. And you lose the dynamic, the, um, the hidden, hidden finger of the market and the accountability of the market. You artificially manipulate the market in one direction or another instead of just letting the market stand on its own. I have no trouble uh, competing with, you know, Tyson, Cargill, whatever. Uh, I can message what I want to message. They message what they message. We're one of the beauties of the internet is that my website can look exactly. Nobody can tell that I'm a I'm a couple million dollar business and Walmart is a multi billion dollar business. When you look at a website, a website is like the you know the ultimate democratized facade. You know, for access, we can compete very well at, at this level, but we can't compete when a bureaucrat comes in and puts his finger on the scale and says, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to push it this way. And then, you know, those big industrial facilities, part of one of the subsidies they get is their capacity to pollute the environment, to create huge amounts of waste and right. concentrated animal feed operations and then not properly dispose it. Whereas a farmer like you will take that waste, recycle it, uh, yeah. use the manure on, the, maybe have 300 hogs on a, on a half a section of property and you raise the corn, they, the hogs eat the corn, the manure goes back into the field and there's a, roughly a closed loop. But if you have 10,000 hogs on that, you know, 320 acre seg, half section and you try to spread that manure on the ground, most of it's going to go off in the rain and, you know, it's going to end up in the water supply, the aquifer, it's yeah. going to turn the soils over nit nitrify the soils and and it, it's going to kill the animals that graze on it uh, you know but that's a subsidy for them it's a, it's a huge... ab, 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 yeah a absolutely it is and and you of course michael pollan uh has written eloquently about this he, he says what we've done is we we have broken apart we have segregated we have segregated our beautiful relational balanced relational you know ecological umbilical and we've turned blessings into a curse, you know, nature loves, loves digested material, you know, manure and urine, you know, the, that's what built the great plains, the, the, the fertile plains of America were built with animals and, and uh, that decomposition.
but when you concentrate things and you overrun your ecological umbilical, then suddenly you've turned a blessing into a curse and you 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 segregate rather than integrate the different components. So we grow the feed over here, we grow the chickens over here, we process them over here, we sell them over there, and none of this, none of this is then you know integrated or related with each other. And so we view we view life as fundamentally a factory in the front door, out the back door, as as opposed to a biological system. The difference between food and other things. And, and you know copper widgets and and PVC pipe is that food is a biological thing and biological things are not just mechanical uh, they have they have a, a totally different dimension and they need rest they're spontaneous they they actually think uh, you know they respond uh, they're they're sentient all these things that a brake lining or a <laughs> you know, a, a wheel bearing in a car uh, doesn't. And so so nature is like that. Nature is that spontaneous, dynamic thinking, conversing, relational kind of thing that you don't get from your, you know, from your car engine or, you know, a, a light socket. One, one last subject, and I'll, I'll let you go. Uh, talk about the drought and the panhandle and the cow shortage. Yeah, so the drought is a big deal. I was in Mississippi last fall, talking to farmers that were actually having their cows, they were stepping into the cracks in the ground, the ground cracks that opened up so wide, cows were stepping in them and breaking their legs and the farmers were having to put their cows down because they were they were losing these cows. You know, the drought is real and I, I don't want to get into a great big, you know, climate debate or anything like that, but all I'm going to, all I'm going to say is droughts are real. They happen routinely. I mean, here on our farm, we we figure, you know, four out of five years, we're going to have a drought at some some time in the year. And so the problem that I see in the news organizations that are covering this, some are trying to find a bogeyman. You know, they're saying it's cheap imports. It might be, you know, cell cultured meat. We're, you know, they're trying to make us eat bugs. I mean, they're looking for a bogeyman. And the ones that that understand that it is the drought that's been incredibly deep throughout the whole South for the last two years, when you don't have you're out, you don't have grass, you don't have grass, you don't have cows. The ones that have done it have, have basically, the tragedy is they throw up their hands and say, well, I'm, I'm just a victim to climate and I can't do anything. But man, the beauty is, the beauty is that we can do something about, about those things. I mean, I've, I've got a kind of a three ingredient recipe. The first ingredient is ponds. You know, back in the 1940s and 50s post uh, Dust Bowl, the, so the old Soil Conservation Service used to partner with farmers to help cost share building ponds. They realized how important it was to hydrate the landscape. Now, they the same USDA considers ponds to be a liability because they make landing spots for wildlife that bring diseases to concentrated animal feeding operations and CAFOs. So we've taken, again, we've taken water that ought to be a wonderful you know, asset and a blessing to, to a nation, and we've turned it into a, to a demon. But 500 years ago, Beavers had eight percent of American landscape. It wasn't America then, but uh, it was it was covered with beaver ponds. Eight percent today were less than four percent water. But when you cover, when you have that much water, like the beaver ponds did, it creates base flow. It fills aquifers. It makes ambient temperatures easier. Uh, evapotranspiration, cloud formation. I mean, there's all sorts of beautiful things that happen. And so I suggest that the first thing we need to do is be on an aggressive pond building campaign so that we eliminate flooding and have water to be able to irrigate. So we're not pulling water from streams and aquifers and things like that. So that as a result of us walking here, we're actually increasing the water commons, not decreasing the water commons. And so on our farm, we've built over 20 ponds over the years. We can now irrigate when the, you know, when the water shuts off and that ameliorates droughts. The second uh, ingredient is organic matter. You know, one pound of organic matter holds four pounds of water. That's the sponginess of the of the soil. And of course, our modern agriculture system with chemical fertilizers that cannibalize out the, the organic matter, tillage that cannibalizes out the or, uh, sing, single, single crop uh, production, all of those things reduce organic matter in the soil. On our farm, we've gone from 1% in 1961 to over 8% today, that 7% increase in organic matter 
which means we can hold 140,000 gallons of water per acre today that we couldn't in 1961. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying this is doable. This is not this is not unattainable. You know, we can we can roll up our sleeves and we can wade into this. We don't have to just we should momentarily repent in sackcloth and ashes for all the damage we've done. Let's do that. But then let's stand up and dust ourselves off and say, okay, this head and these hands that have hurt can also heal. Let's jump on that. So organic matter. And then the third, the third is simply vegetation. We need more vegetation and you don't get vegetation by overgrazing and monocropping, mono, uh, any of that kind of thing. You get vegetation, especially with diversity, you know, where you intermingle forest and pasture and, and perennials and you, you create this abundance. A lot of people don't realize that 500 years ago, North America produced more food than we do today. So with all of our chemical fertilizers, John Deere tractors and everything else, hybrid seeds, we are still not producing the food that was produced here 500 years ago. Now, it wasn't all eaten by people. You know, there were 100 million bison. There were 2 million, 2 million wolves that needed 20 pounds of meat a day. There were, there were bears. I mean, Lewis and Clark expedition said every mile they went, they encountered a bear. That's a lot of bears, okay? So it wasn't all eaten by people, but it, but it was an abundance it was an abundant situation which should give us should give us all in the farming business pause to realize that we have actually in toto over the last 200 years of this nation as great as this nation is i love this country but we have in toto we have actually reduced our ecological abundance our our total productive abundance we reduced it rather than increased it and i suggest that a mandate for tomorrow should be seeing what those workable patterns were and are, and then facilitating them, participating with them on the landscape. So ponds, organic matter, and vegetation are the three ways to mitigate drought. And what I would like to see is as we all, you know, our heart breaks for the drought, but instead of just acting like, well, there's nothing I can do and, and it's out of my hands, Let's meet it head on and let's and let's realize, obviously, we can't completely change the weather. We can't eliminate everything. But there are a lot of things that we can do to mitigate to, I would say, to bring forgiveness and redemptive capacity back into the landscape. We are not just inert bystanders here. We are we are active participants to either help or hurt. And that's where we need to be so that as farmers, we provide oases of hope and help when society becomes hopeless and helpless. Joel Saladin, thank you so much for joining us today and for educating us about all these important subjects. And uh, I hope to have you back on this show soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been an honor. Really great, Joel. That was fantastic. <laughs> Super. <laughs>